Hello, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar titled Impact of Power System Transformation, The Future is Here. So today we'll explore how to apply common sense viable solutions to the transition away from fossil fuels, navigating the dynamics of change for the adoption of operator-driven safety and reliability or ODSR principles and tapping into the potential of smart smart microgrids for more reliable quality and resilient power. So I am delighted to introduce to you our esteemed speaker, Alan M. Ross, CEO and Managing Editor of APC Media. Um, however, I just wanted to ask first if my audio or my mic is um can you hear me clearly or the presentation is visible to your end guy i can hear you okay perfect thank you so much for confirming me with that um sir alan so um you can take over now thank you okay uh you'll see up there on the screen sara s-a-r-a -A, as um the co-founder and chair of uh, and CEO of APC Media. We are a media company that produces communities in the power industry. We have one that's called Transformer Technology, another that's called Power Systems Technology, and another called Women in Power Systems. We formed with a, a group of other people, SARA, the Safety and Reliability Association, uh, a short while ago, actually in late 2023, because as we see the change that's taking place within the power industry, we see several trends that are causing problems. I'm gonna walk through those. One of the difficulties of doing uh, a PowerPoint like this is you, you don't really know who's on the other end of it. So I'm gonna make the assumption that you either turn the lights on or you don't. And if you turn the lights on, whether you're a CEO, whether you run a utility, or whether you are in an industrial organization, you need power. And whatever's happening in this great transformation of power systems, and it is a great transformation, we have seen more change in the last five years than in the previous hundred. Most people think they know what's changing. The problem is most people are probably wrong. Uh, a very few experts, and even from companies like uh, GE Vernova, Hitachi Energy, Siemens Energy, a lot of the bigger energy companies um, have also seen the change and they're adapting their companies, but a lot of mid-sized companies and then a lot of industrial, commercial, and even governmental organizations, they're not leading the way, they're lagging. So as this change comes, as this transformation comes and it's happening rapidly, everybody who wants to turn the lights on is gonna be impacted by it. So first of all, why did we form SARA? What was the point about that? There are a lot of organizations for reliability. I named some of them up here, but for the most part, reliability has been focused on mechanical issues. Why? because electrical reliability has been tremendous. We have over the past century created globally, uh, now I'm not talking about maybe third world countries where you don't even have the potential for uh, a grid, but in those developed countries and developing countries, power has been reliable. And so we didn't really mess with it very much. Suddenly though, things are changing. So we did uh, SARA to focus on electrical safety and reliability. And one of the things is the NFPA, which is National Fire Prevention Association, they have a rule called 70B that, that just came out. And from that rule, we see that there is more toxic electricity and toxic electrical safety issues than ever before. Um, one of the law firms that is looking into this has said this is as going to be as big as asbestos. Now think about that. If you have anything to do with toxic electricity and a group of lawyers says this is going to be as big as asbestos, you need to listen. So that's one of the reasons for SARA is to be able to bring the focus to uh, all markets. The changes, and they are tremendous, and we're gonna go through some of the changes either that, that are being caused or that are 
are uh, caused by changes in, in the world. But it's having an impact on industrial and commercial, commercial markets tremendously. So most people think, oh, that doesn't affect me. I'm not a utility. I'm not an EV manufacturer. It really doesn't affect me. I, but unfortunately, what the utilities are doing and having to deal with and what happens with the electrification of transportation and what that means to the grid impacts power quality, resilience, and reliability. In real simple terms, reliability is keep the lights on. Resilience is get them back on after we have an outage. And power, power quality is I don't understand why my lights are flickering or why my robots aren't working well or whatever the downstream is of the problems with resilience and reliability. So they're going to impact markets more than most people realize. Uh, I have to make a presentation tomorrow at the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop and these are professionals in industrial and, and commercial and utilities. And it's a similar presentation I'm making to them because most of the people there are over 50. I was at the uh, event yesterday and I saw what I would call a tsunami of gray, meaning the amount of gray hairs I saw in there, including my own. And so consequently, uh, we've got this group of people that Number one, have not seen as much change as they're seeing now. And number two, we've got the brain drain. There's a lot of people over 55, over 60, especially over 65, that are leaving the market. So you lose even that legacy knowledge. Safety and reliability can be seen as the two sides of the same coin. You know, you flip it up in the air, and one side is safety. You flip it back again, and the next side is, is reliability. Um, they work together, and I, I'm going to give you a quick uh, sample of why. If I said to people, and I do, what is this? And, and it's been in the news. It's not something that hasn't been in the news. Most people say, well, it looks like a refinery that had some sort of fire. Well, it had an explosion. In that explosion, 15 workers were killed and 200 were injured. The reason for the explosion, and oh, by the way, this company, it was in Texas City, Texas, it was originally a Texaco refinery a hundred years ago and has been bought by other people. Uh, when the explosion happened, it happened to be owned by BP. Uh, and BP was trying to address the aging infrastructure of this, uh, this refinery. But interesting, this plant was giving a safety award. The month before, 15 workers were killed and 200 were injured. I mean, that just seems kind of heinous. How could you give a plant a safety award and then kill 15 people and have that many workers injured? What's this one? Most people know it because they see it out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's the Deepwater Horizon, the oil rig that uh, blew up. 11 workers were killed. A lot of workers were injured and multi-millions billions, I think even, of gallons of oil spewed into the Gulf of Mexico, and it still has not recovered. Now, we created some, some uh, algae eating thing or something that ate some of the oil, but a lot of the life of the Gulf was impacted, and there are huge dead zones that remain. So why do I bring this up? There were two safety VPs that were flying out on a helicopter to the oil rig when it blew up. They were about to present a safety award. Both of these organizations had some things in common. Let's look at what that was. One of them is they both had pretty lax maintenance practices. They had problems that had been reported, so their reliability was low, but yet they got safety awards. Uh, in one instance on the Deepwater Horizon, one of the workers had said the cause of the, what ended up being the cause of the explosion was a uh, in, in one of the drilling mechanisms that they had a lot of give in it. And he had reported it multiple times that this was a future problem, that this was going to be a problem. And uh, 15 workers were killed as a result of lax maintenance practices. And the others, as I said, they were about to receive safety awards. Um, I, I, I find it, I would say funny, but it's not funny when that many people die. So safety, reliability, and resilience. Why do I focus on safety first? Is because it is a looming problem. And I'm not talking about just when things like this happen at plants or at refineries or 
at oil rigs. Uh, it's because safety is becoming an even more li big liability for uh, industrial and commercial opportunities. Almost every organization I know of has, has a safety top priority. You ask, you go into a meeting and you say, who's responsible for safety? Everybody lists the hand up. Everybody's responsible. You go in and say, who's responsible for reliability? No hands go up. Everybody points at everybody else. Must be somebody else. You know who's responsible for maintenance because they have a maintenance department. But I'm talking about reliability. Maintenance is going out and doing work that sometimes doesn't need to be done. And reliability is keeping something operating. So they have these policies, standards, processes, systems, and they're committed to enforcing the safety policies. But our take is if you, if you took an organization that said safety is a top priority, what if we said safety and reliability is a top priority? Or safety, reliability, and resilience is a top priority? That's what's happening in the utility industry. That is not happening in industrial and commercial. It's usually reliability or just safety and they're not tied together and trust me they are uh, definitely an intermingled let me show you why i know it's hard to see the blue dots but you don't have to we've got some data over a 53 month period uh, you measure reliability by what is called asset utilization so how how much of your assets are employed or um, operational effectiveness, and it's the equipment effectiveness. How off? So the AU is measuring all assets, and the OEE is measuring those assets that you want in production. So anything under maintenance or anything that's stored or seconds or any kind of assets that, that is not actively involved in operations is taken out of the OEE. But they're both pretty good measures. And if you see on the right-hand side, you see that as OEE goes up, so does the injury, the, uh, the, excuse me, as OEE or AU go up, the injury rate goes down. As one goes up, the other goes down. Pretty strong correlation. And as you see that correlation, it, it seems to me that organizations should say, hmm, maybe by being a more reliable organization, we can increase our safety rather than just publish paste safety policies and put a bunch of safety po posters up in the organization or fly out to a blowing up oil rig to give a safety award. Another one, this is correlation of corrective and reactive maintenance. Corrective maintenance is you're actually, you see something, you're monitoring, see something in a piece of equipment. Reactive is it failed, it broke you get a lot more injuries when you have to react to work. So you see your total injuries are going up with reactive work orders and with, than they are with corrective. The more corrective work orders you do, you actually reduce your injury rate. So the idea that uh, repairs and maintenance are separated, they're usually put together, repairs and maintenance. Unfortunately, they're not the same. Repairs mean something broke. The number of injuries that happen with, with repairs of electrical equipment versus repairs, uh, excuse me, versus um, corrective or maintenance of electrical equipment is almost double. The number of deaths from electrical injuries in the United States has not gone down in the last five, six, seven years. It stays pretty relevant. We're, we're killing the same number of workers we have. It's the third leading cause of death uh, by OSHA. Now, we don't call all electrical injuries electrical because sometimes when somebody gets blown off of a rig or blown off of a platform, they call it a fall from height when it actually they touched electrical and that caused them to, uh, to fall. So it's probably even higher than we think. And then lastly, the correlation of, of preventive and predictive maintenance work orders with injury rate. The more preventive and predictive maintenance work orders you do, and this was from a large chemical plant, again, over the 53 months, you can see that the total injuries per year has gone down. It's quite amazing how uh, the correlation is undeniable. I have a dear friend, you see him here, the RM group. It is a gentleman named Ron Moore. These are his statistics. And Ron Moore, when he presents and he does prevent, present at large conferences, he walks across the stage and in his 
Tennessee Twang, he says, I've got the data. He's not just saying, I think this would be the case. I've got the data to show that better reliability creates better safety. Let's move to the next one, resilience. What are the challenges to the existing grid, the infrastructure? Now I'm talking about the utility grid, but it's actually true of everything. It's aging. It's aging tremendously. You know, most of the transmission and distribution lines in the USA have been built in 1960. That includes transformers. They were built with a 50 to 60 year lifespan. Add 50 years to 1960 or add 60 years. And guess what? We are at the outer edge of that lifespan. And as a result of that, you got all kinds of problems just from aging. Add to that, you're now getting major weather out outages across the U.S., but it's global. You're getting major weather outages. When you have major storms to aging equipment, the good news is you can replace it with new equipment. The bad news is trying to get replacement equipment. The lead time on power transformers used to be about 18 months to 24 months. The lead time on power transformers now, depending upon the size, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 48 to 60 months. So if you have a major event and you lose a large section of your grid, unless you purchased transformers five years ago, you're in trouble. So now you've got this aging infrastructure with severe weather out outages causing a disruption and, and changes within the grid itself. Cyber sab sabotage. We don't need to talk a lot about it, but this is an interesting one uh, that came out from the Edison Institute. What, the, what they said is it's not major, si there's major cyber sab sabotage, obviously, people trying to shut the grid down. But what this says is if you just take some small things, like you take a laptop and then a laptop goes through somebody's home that goes through their uh, smart water heater, impacts it, impacts their uh, charging station or their storage from their electrical vehicle, that coupled with somebody else's oven, coupled with a refrigerator, coupled with a laptop, coupled with another refrigerator, can shut a pretty large portion of the grid, grid down. When that's able to happen, it takes a series of little events to create cyber sabotage. That's a hard one to say. Cyber sabotage is growing. We know it. There are groups of people that do nothing but try to protect the grid. Utilities are doing it every day. They see constantly these problems of people trying to, to do it. There are bad actors uh, coming from countries like Russia, uh, the uh, China and, and South, uh, North Korea, just bad actors. That's, that's cyber sabotage coming from governments. But there's also people, including in the United States and Europe, that just sit around trying to bring something down, the anarchists, if you'd call them. And they're not necessarily working in harmony with each other. They're just, they just do it because they think they can, and that's a shame. But they have to protect against uh, what I would consider to be uh, uh, grid scale sabotage and also micro scale sabotage. And for the most part, they're doing a good job, but it is constant vigilance that has to happen. Physical sabotage. Uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was in Sacramento and I was moderating a panel with uh, the Sacramento Municipal uh, Utility with PG&E and with uh, Idaho Power. They were selected for a reason. The three people, the experts that came, shared. And what they shared was uh, the amount of physical sabot sabotage they've had. People wantingly trying to destroy electrical equipment, shooting at transformers, trying to put oil, uh, holes in the transformer uh, radiators, the oil drains out, the transformer overheats, shuts down and creates a problem, or shooting at bushings. Because if you hit a bushing, many times you can create an explosion and you can create an oil spew and a fire that can't be put out by fire people. It has to burn out. And if you get a 5,000 gallon uh, transformer, oil filled transformer, it can take days for that to burn out. So you can't even go in and do remediation or do resilience planning. Duke Energy reported, and, and it's interesting because most of the time these don't get reported. And I'll go back to the, the three that I mentioned. 
there were seven transformers, excuse me, seven substations fired upon and shot out in Moore County. Just people with rifles shooting. Are they the same shooter or are they a group of people going around doing it? They don't know because they never caught them. Why? Because it's there, because it's vulnerable, because people do it for fun, because people have too many guns in the United States. Sorry, Second Amendment people. But it's kind of crazy when you get the, all of these substations shut down. If it hadn't been for Duke Energy having a great backup system where they could write, route power around, there would have been a major out, outage in that area of the country. As it turns out, there were a few things that crippled some of the substations and some of the com customers, but allowed them to route power around. But it could have been much worse. I want to go to the ones, the SMUD, Sacramento, uh, and to this one. This is particularly heinous. This is the Hell's Canyon area of the uh, Idaho power. It actually goes into several states and it goes into a whole bunch of counties. And if you see that that yellow, that excuse me, that blue line, it's kind of a series of uh, waterfalls. And they, of course, then use hydropower, a great, great example of wonderful hydropower uh, using the power of water. Now you get into the well, they had to put up dams to create the power, but not talking about all of that. They've done a great job in Idaho of making sure that they had natural habitat protected and it creates power for Washington state, for Idaho and uh, for other other local areas. They had on camera, uh, and they had that's what they presented. I was not able to get that because they will not share it, but I was able to watch as they showed on camera coming from uh, the up where it says Hell's Canyon, somebody on a motorcycle drive down to Langley Gulch and Swin Falls area, fire at a transformer, drive down to Niagara Spring, Springs, fire at a transformer. Now they called the police in both instances. It was a 20 minute call in to get to Niagara Springs. It was a similar time to get to Swan Falls, down to Twin Falls where it's almost a dead end. You can't continue on to American Falls. The road ends. If the road hadn't ended, the person could have continued and gotten out. But because the road ended, they could put the police up at the top, but they also shot out at Twin Falls. Why? One person, on a motorcycle and they caught the person. And uh, I think it's May of this year that person goes uh, uh, to court uh, for the damage that they've done and the cost. And this is gonna cost probably in the extreme hundreds of thousands, if not in the millions. They avoided large scale outages again because he didn't shut down any of the substations. If they had not gotten there and been able to um, route things around, they would have had transformer failures. Again, si this is physical sabotage. Similar things happening in uh, PG&E's area and definitely similar things happening within SMUD, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the vulnerability of the grid. What are we gonna do with it? How are we going to protect ourselves from it? In the United States, if, if you take up this Tres Amigas that's just in Clovis, New Mexico, that was a map that I got from them. You see in the light blue, the Eastern interconnection is what it's called. And the dark blue is the Western interconnection. And then in the very, very light blue is the Texas interconnection or it's called ERCOT. It's kind of their own grid. ERCOT used to brag that they were, you know, safer than everybody else until they had a freeze and, uh, and until they had people paying $100,000 bills because they're based on money. It's not based on anything but how much, uh, how little power you have that you pay more for it. So it's a different way of looking at it. The entire ERCOT board was uh, let go or resigned as a result of the, the freeze. Now they've got forest, they got fires in Texas, whatever it is, these things have, have problems. Interestingly enough, from a small scale attack, we risk, as, the, as you, you can see right there, we risk a complete shutdown of the entire interconnection. Because it's an interconnection, because they are you know, large power lines. By the way, they don't cross over one to the other. So if you have one in a dark blue state, uh, say, uh, or a mid blue state like Nebraska, and you have one next to it, and I think that next to it is Colorado, 
you don't you can't share power over because the way the grid was formed it was formed to be two separate interconnections and now there's talk of well how does it work when you have a lot of distributed energy resources not just big power generation and when these interconnections were put in place that's what we relied on large scale power generation whether that be hydro coal nuclear or, or gas, which are primarily peaker plants. Those are the, the, the large hydro, and that's not what we're trying to do because all of them, except hydro, uh, excuse me, has one thing in common. They either have some oil and gas uh, connection that we're trying to decarbonize from, or nuclear, because people are concerned about nuclear, uh, even though some of the newer the newer nuclear facilities are as safe as they ever could be, but they still produce uh, nuclear fuel that has to be uh, has to be stored. So consequently, this is how it looked, and it's not looking like this anymore. In 2024, almost all new U.S. grid capacity, 58% of it is going to be solar. 23% is battery. Thank goodness for that, because until storage started to come on place, we were wasting a lot of the wind and the solar. 13% solar, 4% gas, 2% nuclear. So what you see in that is a complete change in how we are creating carbon-free fuels. So the, the battery storage, wind and solar. Just a quick one about that. I was at the RE Plus event doing interviews in 2023. It was September. In 2022 of September, there were 15,000 attendees and there were about 850 uh, exhibitors. In 2023, there were 40,000 attendees and there were almost 15,000 exhibitors, 1,500, excuse me, exhibitors. What was the difference? Storage showed up. We finally have gotten storage to the point and we've only just started whether that's flow batteries or whether that's utility grade storage or whether that's hydrogen, whatever we're looking at, we're now able to store some of the wind and the solar that we previously weren't able to use. It is predicted or it is, it is um, calculated that we only used about 60, excuse me, 38 percent of the solar that we generate. Why is because we don't need it when it's when it when it's generated, but we need it when the sun goes down. So that means 62 percent is not used until you can store it. Now that you can store it, guess what? You're able to use it. So this is changing the whole thing. The wind and solar are here. The the Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, infrastructure bill have done more in the past four years to change everything so rapidly um that it that it, it excites me because i believe in decarbonization however uh, not many people realize how much has been accomplished because we still have a lot of problems and that's kind of what people focus on one of the big problems is electric transfer transportation i rented a uh, a tesla in california when i was visiting uh with my son and daughter-in-law and young grandchild while i was out there I constantly worried, constantly worried about, was I going to have enough charge? I pull into a Tesla station. I only had 43% charge. I wasn't trying to go on a long trip. I just wanted to go back and forth from uh, a company I was visiting and my, my son's house. But I was couldn't, I watched that go down, 43%, 38%, 37%. So I pull into a Tesla recharging station, and it was a big one every Every one of them was full. The fast charging stations, the slow charging chain. There were about five or six people, and I'm telling you, there were about 30 charging stations. There were about five or six people with their vehicles. Everybody else had gone in the mall shopping. So that's great. Now, I can't go unplug their car and move it. I just have to wait, and you wait. And then you get in line because somebody else is waiting, and he's on the other side of the thing, and he thinks he get. It was too much stress. You know how many rental cars I have rented, and I probably rented about 20 since then? None. I won't rent an electric car in California, where the infrastructure is better than most other states by multiples. So until we get that right, we think, oh, you know, we're never going to get right. The, the, the real issue is we're getting it right as it relates to the generation, the storage, and where we're going with it. It's, it's a delight to see. Uh, at the same time, we've got a lot of work to do. 
this is something that I think the U.S. Department of Energy, when you look at this resilient power, it, it, it reduces the it's just what we need to focus on because it limits the scope and impact of the outages when they do occur. We're not saying, oh, if they occur, it's when they do occur. occur. Why? Because of weather events, because we've now got a pretty good understanding between fires. Again, there's one going on right now in Calif in uh, Texas. California, what have we got now? We got mudslides and we got snow up in the higher elevations and too much water. And two years ago, we had terrible forest fires. It caused PG&E, a very good company, a company with a great history, a, a great public facing uh, uh mantra to go bankrupt. Why? Is because they had electrical outages that caused the fires and people lost lives and people lost their homes. And so consequently, the, the potential liability from that caused them to have to go into uh, a bankrupt situation. There are things now that the state of California is doing to make sure that the utilities are able to to do what they need to do. But remember, they built these old systems with gigantic power lines running, you know, with uh, high voltage electrical power. And all of a sudden they have a forest fire and a line comes down and you get a spark and it creates more forest fires and it continues. It can start with somebody doing arson, but it usually it gets multiple impacts because of all the things that happen. Santa Ana winds caused a lot of the problems. And every year in California, they get Santa Ana winds. This year, they were almost hurricane strength. They were at the, uh, uh, what is it, level one hurricane. And so the, the world is changing rapidly. Um, who would have thought that the, uh, there was a, uh, a potential hurricane that could not power out in New York and, and, and floods substations, especially the underground substations, which are really they can take a lot of water, but they can't take a lot of water for a lot of time. And so consequently, resilience is, it's gone out. Now, how do we get it back on? I want to go back to safety. When we send workers into an outage, that means there's been something damaged down. They have to bring power back up. And when they bring that back up, whether that's a transformer or a major uh, a transmission line or a distribution transformer or a distribution line, when they bring that power back up, they're at greater risk of harm. And that's what we're trying to impact. Keep it resilient, keep it reliable. And maybe we don't have those people that are going out into harm's way. Workers who went to work that day thinking they were going home to their family that afternoon and never make it home. And those that don't make it, who, who may not die, but have severe burns and problems. Uh, I have seen some of the problems that happen when people are electrocuted, but don't die. It's terrible. The electricity goes in somewhere and it decides where it wants to go out, wherever it wants to go out. And nine times out of 10, it destroys a lot of organs on the way. Electrocution uh, from workers is something that we ought to be working on. and. By doing it, by working a safe, reliable grid, it becomes a more resilient grid because we can put it back, we can get it back on power quickly. So the whole point of this is you know you're going to have a disruptive event. We're not saying, oh, let's try to make it so that we don't. But we're still struggling with Puerto Rico. Luma Energy, who went in uh, to, to try to fix it, has been trying to fix it. But since the hurricane, they've had another hurricane. Then they had an earthquake. Then they had some forest fires. I don't know how an organization can do what they need to do to get the entire island back up as much as they have. And they've gotten a lot of grief as a result of it. But um, they're working in a resilience approach. What they're also trying to do is recognize they're going to have disruptive events. We have another hurricane season coming up. Will Puerto Rico get hit? It seems to be right in the way, but it could be uh, New Orleans once again. And if you remember, people died because the hospital lost power. The generators didn't work and they couldn't get them to another hospital. Th these disruptive events are happening more and more around the world. 
And what we've got to do is reduce the magnitude of disruption and increase the speed with which we get recovery. That's what utilities are doing. That's what the Department of Energy is doing. That's what's happening with, with the IRA. That's what we're trying to accomplish in the power industry. And I'm a member of the power industry. So I, I know the people that are trying to do it. And I will say I've never worked with a, a more dedicated group of people uh, that are willing to put themselves at harm way, whether they're boots on the ground or whether they're the people back at the offices trying to make sure that the people with boots on the ground are safe. So the idea that we should be working on resilience goals, and that is now part of what the U U.S. Department of Energy is, is counting. It used to be safety, reliability, and they had goals for that. Now they're having resilience goals. They're not telling you that you can't have the event. What they're saying is when you have the event, reduce the magnitude and improve the speed of recovery. This is a case in point in London. I use this because it was public. Most of the time, these things you don't hear about. So they had a once in a decade blackout in 2019. And it was a, an outage provoked by failure of a wind park control system. And I, I say this, and this is one of the ones that I want to really focus on, because wind and solar are changing the reliability of the grid. Why? Because of this. You've got one wind. And what happened in London was the strike caused a routine fault on the national tr tr transmission routine. The fault gets reported, they route around it, everything works. But there were small generators connected at the local network. When that large fault happened that they tried to route around and tried to get the generators running, they automatically became disconnected following the lightning strike. Should not have gotten disconnected, but they did. So now you've got this rippling effect that happened. Two of the larger wind, wind generators at Hornsey and at uh, Little Barford, they are also technical issues because of the near simultaneous problems that everything was happening. So they go out. So you got one lightning strike causes one problem that could be routed around, but several small generators connected to the local distribution go out. And then the two larger wind generators go out. Remember, they're generating power. All of this generation caused the system to drop frequency. It fell rapidly. And all of a sudden, you've got a large part of London that goes out. Why do I use this as an example? It's because the systems that we're putting into place with wind and solar are so much more complex than the systems that we had before. We used to generate en masse. We would transmit a large, long generation, excuse me, transmission lines. You've seen them, big tall towers with high power lines and things that say, you know, caution, high voltage, because you transmit high voltage and then you drop down that voltage to use at low voltage, high ampere so that you get power at the, the home or at the uh, industrial site or in the, um, in the data center, hospital, whatever you want. So that's our old system, drop down power. Well, now we have power everywhere because you've got not only power coming down, you've also got power from wind and solar and they are not connected. They're all going into a central area called a utility. They have to take it in, they have to control it all, they have to make sure that it's equalized. So they've got a different problem than they had before. In the past, all they had to do was flow the, the power down. Now utilities have to take it in. So suddenly they got a lot of different places, including, I mentioned my son in California, he has a rooftop solar. When the sun is shining and it, he, if he sells power back to the uh, Southern Cal Edison, they have to pay him for that power. His bills got, went from 400 and something dollars for his electrical bills a month in the summertime to $23. He runs his electric car off of it. He has become a prosumer. He's producing electricity and sending it back to the grid. And the poor utility is saying, wait a minute, you used to be a rate payer. We just caused you to pay rates. Now you're a prosumer. You're sending us power and you're, you're a consumer and you're a rate payer. And they've got the complexity of taking all that into place. And then, of course, a storm comes. And what does my son want? He wants to make sure he's got power. If the storm comes and the, the clouds have come over and the solar's not really working, he wants to make sure he can get it from Southern Cal Edison. 
as do a million other people in that area. So it's a much more complex system than we've ever had before. And whether it's cybersecurity or whether it's uh, physical uh, security or, or, uh, and attacks, or whether it's just the complexity of the system, uh, it's getting more and more difficult. So when the demand disconnect came, choo, power outage, all of London. And there you see, uh, it's not the London Bridge, but one of the Thames River Bridges, and they lost power as did Big Ben. And so shutting Big Ben down was a big thing in, in London, England. So what, what are we trying to do? This is one of the most complex slides that you will ever see. It's from Edison Electric, and it's reimagining the grid. I do this because I want to say, where are we now? This is where we are now. These orange dots is where we are now. And it is amazing. And I go back to the IRA, and I go back to the... Uh, the uh, uh, the fact that we've made a huge investment to bring us to where we are now. But where we have to go is very unique. So where are we? We've got this human-led. It's AI-assisted, but we really haven't figured out. But we operate our grids by human beings. They have intraday. They're ahead of the market. We have good outage management, the best that we can. And we got pow bulk power dispatch. We're still transmitting down from uh, coal, oil, etc. We're transmitting from uh, wind and solar, large wind scale, utility scale wind and solar. We're transmitting from utility scale storage. But all of these things are days and hours. So when you have outages, it's days and hours. And, and, and that's, we think, is good. You know, if you can keep things down to days, it's good. But we moved ahead. And our current evolution is we said, you know what, if we could do automated digital control, so it wasn't human led, it wasn't an individual with gray hair said, you know, I've seen this before and they do something. Now you got voltage and frequency regulation, but you get these dynamic control systems. It's adaptive protection. DER services is, is distributed energy uh, uh, services. So what you've got is wind and solar is now automated in terms of what's coming in. You regulate the voltage much better than you did before. And you've got these uh, behind the meter based operations. So you're seeing what's happening at your customer's level. You've got real time observability. You can see it and you can make decisions, still human led decisions. So we're in, that's where we are right now. And things happen in minutes. It is a huge plus. We've come a long, long way. However, we've got a long way to go because of the complexities that I just shared with you. And this is where we're going. This is what the industry is working on. I'm so delighted. Uh, last week at Distributech, uh, which is a conference in, can you remember where I was? Orlando. I interviewed thought leaders from all of the big companies. I asked them two questions. Where are we? And you see the first three orange dots. And where are we going? What does the next five to 10 years look like? And this is what it looks like. Taking out the human error and having predictability in, and this is where AI really comes in. If we have enough shared data, and that's one of the things we're all fighting because everybody thinks they own the data. The truth is the data should belong to the, 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 the uh, all of us. And that data ought to be used to be able to say, hey, we can make better predictions and reduce human errors when we got shared shared data. We ought to have some way of digital control to see what's happening out there. And that's this virtualized control and protection. Um, there's a thing called digital twins. I think Siemens and a company called Bentley Systems created the first substation digital twin. So whatever happens in the digital world happens in the, the real world and vice versa. Whatever happens in the digital world, you put it over into the uh, from the real world into the digital world. It's quite brilliant, frank, frankly. Now you've got AI at its fullest. Now you're being able to take projections. You're being able to say, what happens if you see a storm coming? You throw it into the digital world and you say, hey, a storm's coming. Well, what's going to happen? And you see over in the virtual side what you can do to bring more reliability or resilience or whatever it is. It's real-time automated excuse me, operations. You get the ITOT integration and suddenly... Now you've got data that's happening in microseconds or milliseconds, and then you've got a, a, an operating system that is working in seconds or milliseconds 
that's bringing resilience up. And that's where the Department of Energy is talking about. Can you bring it back in days or hours? Yes. Can you bring it back in minutes? In some cases, yes. We still have a lot of work. What we want is bringing it back in seconds and milliseconds. It's going to take a, an extremely concerted effort to do that. I'm just going to leave these up. Uh, we're going to take some questions here in a minute, but I want to leave these up. These are people that are part of uh, the IRA, the invest, the uh, what is it? Inflation Reduction Act, a dumb name for something that's causing a lot of things that is working. And these are some of the leaders of that. You can see that they're they're all focused on everything I just talked to you about. They're saying, here's what the investment's going to do. Here's the innovation in this clean energy sector. Here's what's going to happen as we continue to support innovation. These are all people from the Department of Energy. And then here's Jennifer Granholm. She is the Secretary of Energy. And Jennifer is a brilliant woman. Uh, I've heard her speak a couple of times. And here's the thing that she presses. It's about jobs, jobs, jobs. Now, she said this in the past, and it is true. It's our, our unemployment rate is down because green energy is producing a lot of jobs, good paying jobs in the United States. It's also producing them in Canada, and it's producing them in Europe, and it's producing them in other places. So the idea is, can we build our economy? Can we make it safer? Can we make it more resilient? Can we keep the lights on? The answer would be, yeah and save the planet at the same time. So it's a pretty exciting field to work in. Um, I am not 35 years old. I wish I were because I would be so excited about this industry, but it keeps me excited anyway. These are the summaries. Reliability and resilience of the grid is gonna impact everything. It, and I didn't put up here consumer life, but definitely consumer life. You see what's happening from an aging infrastructure severe weather, sabotage. There's a lot of that going on. And the move to clean and green, even though distributed energy resources is, is a good positive, it's also creating problems. And it's necessary for decarbonization, but it's making operating the grid more complex. And the use and impact of adopting digital solutions is going to be the answer. And digital solutions have to go across these three boundaries of ERCOT, uh, Western and Eastern, and they have to go across boundaries of from the utility down into my, my son's car. Because at some point, if he's got power in his car and the utility needs it, he can sell that power back to us. If he's not going anywhere for a while and a high need, he can sell that back. It's a complex system. And uh, that's the one word I would leave up here if I were doing this again. It's a complex system. So with that, we'll take any questions. I don't know if I leave this up or what I do with it, uh, Lady Anne. Sure. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Mr. Allen. Um, your, expertise, your expertise and passion for this topic truly really shown through. So we really appreciate your value insights with it. So now it's time for our audience to engage with you. And, and if you have any questions, um, everyone, please feel free to type them into the chat box and we will address as many as we can. So let Lady Anne, will you get them and will you or do I close this and see it in the chat box? Yes, actually, I can definitely um, show the question on the chat um, or on the screen also. Okay. So let me check the other question. So there is a question here from Sushantja. Let me go ahead and show this one on the stage. So what's the cure for aging? You you say what's the cure for an aging transform for aging equipment? Yes. Uh, is is uh well there is no fountain of youth, right? So you can't cure aging. Um the the what we have to do is new equipment, and, and this is a double problem. I, I didn't have the time to go into this. I mentioned the transformers and power equipment made in the 1980s is now aging out, 1960s aging out. The problem is, is newer transformers alone, just take that one asset, are not as robust as they've been in the past. So not only do you have an aging problem, you have a fact that the newer ones are not gonna last longer. To me, the, the cure for aging is, is going back to the existing infrastructure and really putting in, don't expect it to age and fail. 
because some of the best transformers, some of the best electrical equipment of every sort out there uh, is old equipment. It can last 75 years. So the idea is do good maintenance, proactive, predictive maintenance, and make sure the existing infrastructure uh, lasts longer. And don't just change out something because it's old. Change it out because you have condition monitoring. So I would say the answer for aging is condition monitoring of assets. And then as you see a, a, an asset that's beginning to show signs of, of failure, those are the ones that you replace. There was a study done by Southern Cal Edison, a study, it was bigger than that. Southern Cal Edison back, I think it was six or seven years ago, they had a group of uh, AI uh, brainiacs and they were all data scientists. They were not electrical engineers. They uh, looked at transformers, power transformers in substations. So this is large distribution transformers. But they're, they're, you know, if you go through a substation and you see the fence and this gigantic transformer, that's what they were looking at. They were replacing them based on their age. So they did a study and they back tested it. They said, what if we hadn't done that four years ago? How many transformers that we replaced would we have not replaced and how many that we didn't replace could we have seen were a problem and they did some and they based the conditions on things that they really didn't even have good condition data in in my opinion they had like the humidity of the and they could get it from historical data the humidity of the substation how much sun it was how much load those kinds of things and they realized that they could have saved several million dollars by not replacing transformers that were good and they replaced them just they did that for i think four years and then finally they realized every year they were able to save four to five million dollars on not replacing transformers but more importantly they were not exacerbating the problem by replacing transformers that were good so they started now doing more data gathering so now they monitor those transformers they look at the insides of them they check the oil they test it and they see how the transformer is aging as a result of that they're saving millions of dollars, but they're also they're they're helping not throw away good transformers that don't need to be thrown away. Same is true of a lot of equipment. There are some equipment that like cables are like transformers. Just because they're 50 years old doesn't mean they should be replaced. Most cable failures are at splices. They're not because the cable fails. And so consequently, um, good condition monitoring, replacing only what needs to be replaced based on the commission. Um, condition is probably the cure for aging. Good question. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Allen. So I also see a question from Mr. Martilin. So let me show you this one. What is the emerging role of private equity investment in power system transformations? Ooh, private equity. We have been depending so much on uh, government spending, Department of Energy, IRA, all of that, that, that my concern two years ago was what happens when the subsidies go away? Guess what? We no longer need subsidies for wind and solar. They are now, they can, they can make money for private investment. So if I were uh, in the equity investments, I would be looking for uh, operational investments, not innovation investments because we've done a lot of that but operational investments in wind and solar and then selling that power back i think the next big one and i think this is going to happen it's already happened in a couple of places right now there are six bakeries in california i think it's called bebo bakeries none of them they're bakeries they use a lot of power right they bake bread and cakes and other things they are off the grid they have microgrids they have wind and solar storage and they run their bakery through that. Uh, now it's California, so they have a lot of they had a, have a lot of uh, uh, solar. But the idea that um, if I were running a private equity firm, I would find people that know how to put in industrial scale or data center scale microgrids, and they're they're new technologies, not just solar on the roof. You put solar on the roof, and you stick five or six of these new uh, I think they're called funnel wind towers. They're not the big blades, but they actually funnel like this. And you can create enough generation with utility grade storage, put a couple of uh, large scale containers. There's the size of uh, 18 wheeler containers and you fill them up with storage. And guess what you've got? You've got a microgrid. 
you don't have to take power from the grid. And I think that's going to be a huge one, not just for industrial and commercial. I think it's going to be municipal because at the food bottom of the food chain is the municipal and co-ops. They're the ones that are out there, you know, on their own in as called utilities, but they're, they're the end of the utility scale as it drops down. But for municipal, industrial, uh, you can run steel plants with a microgrid today. And many of the steel companies and the paper and the people that are, you know, refineries are in places where they have land around. So you could put in a, a solar farm, wind farm, storage, and get off the grid completely. Now, you're still going to have to have the resilience problem. If you had a hurricane hit, you've got to figure out. So uh, I think there's contracts that could be let to say, hey, you'll come in and you will, you'll bring other power in. So private equity should find the places of change uh, and not be afraid to move into it. Where the government's moved out, now you could move in. I think another one is hydrogen. Hydrogen is going to be a, uh, a great investment area. I, and I'm not talking about the gold hydrogen that they found in France or, you know, there's supposedly a lot of gold hydrogen, which is drilling down, you find it. But we don't have an infrastructure for, for that like we have for natural gas. And I don't think we can build one out. That's a 40-year build, and that's going to take governments to do it. I don't think that is a private equity investment. I think they can come in the end. But hydrogen, uh, in terms of storage today, is a good way of looking at it. Storage is another another one. ESS, it's um, uh, ESS is elect. I can't remember what the E is, but it's uh, high grade storage, large storage systems. And as a result of that, some of the companies in that space are growing. So whether that's investing in the growing companies, some of which are sold out. There's a company called Infinity Systems. Uh, a gentleman I know is a brilliant CEO of that. He sold out for three years. I would invest in plants because if he has more plants, he can he can build more. But uh, there's a lot of that. There's a company called Dragonfly Energy, publicly traded company, brilliant company. They have actually patented the future. So there's a lot of things in the space that uh, can continue with the power systems transformation. But I would believe it would be microgrids, uh, utility scale, wind and solar, and or and microgrids kind of come into that at a small utility scale and or investing in the companies that are already doing some major things in storage. I see we have three minutes. Yes. So thank you. Thank you so much for this one, Mr. Allen. So we still have three minutes for this. We really wanted to um, answer all of the questions. So if someone wanted to connect with you or yeah, connect with you with this topic, can you please leave your email address as well on the chat box? Okay, it is. Uh, oh, you want me to put it in the chat box, do you? <laughs> It's alan, A-L-N, dot Ross, at APC dot media. Let's go here. What would you like to, yeah. There we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you all so much for that, Mr. Alan. So everyone, if you wanted to connect with this topic, to Mr. Allen, the email address of him is already attached with a, uh, with our chat box. So you can definitely um copy with uh this one and paste it to um something or note take note of this. And aside from that, I will also leave my email address here on the chat for um those who are not yet a member of um the ITC. You can definitely um leave a message with me and. For before we wrap up for today's session, I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is recording. So will be uh, this this webinar is recording and uh, it, it will be available on the ITC YouTube channel. Additionally, attend today's webinar qualifies you for a complimentary membership. So if you're not already a member, keep an eye on your email for more details, including your participation certificate. So um, before we conclude, do you have any final would like to share with us um, Mr. Allen. Well, I see that we've got a question from the CEO of the Acuna Studio, and I think the question is, I can imagine this could have been avoided in this case. I assume that was talking about uh, one of the, because it was about an hour ago, I assume that was talking about one of the failures at the Texas oil refinery. 
uh, Texas City oil refinery or the deep water absolutely could have been avoided, 100% avoidable. Uh, there are lawsuits right now because the fact it wasn't, and that's a shame. And it could have been avoided by doing proper maintenance. I hope Thank that answers you. your question. Thank you so much, Mr. Allen. So, okay, um, I really appreciate you everything um everything that you did today and thank you to all of our participants us today we hope you find this webinar you found the webinar informative and engaging remember to stay connected with us for the future events and updates so have a great um afternoon to you everyone thank Bye -bye you lady thank you itc thank you so much mr allen have a good one too